Welcome to the Adam Savage Project. I'm Adam. I'm Norm. And I'm Jen. Hi, Jen Schachter. It is good to see you on the podcast again. You too. You too. I'm reporting in from my cave here. <laughs> Excellent. It looks like a great cave. I see a display case behind you. I see an E.T. Uh, is that a Carmen Sandiego costume? It is, yeah. I have a, I have all of my crea- my Halloween creations gathered around me <laughs> at all times. Excellent. And that video camera is for your April O'Neil costume, right? Yeah, yeah, that was last year. Last year I was uh, April O'Neil. I did a scratch-built camcorder. It's a, it's a flashlight with some styrene and a, a fan remote control as the buttons. So, yeah. I wish I had known because I have here in my camera department a fake resin news camera what? meant to use as a prop in movies. And I bought it planning to play an epic trick on my cameraman Saza, and I never got around to playing the epic trick. I was going to hide it in a scissor lift and like throw it down to him. <laughs> I mean, not so that he'd catch it, but basically have it drop off while he was watching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and awesome. Jen, you've been embarking on a bunch of projects uh, as people are listening to this, because uh, there's a video on Tested right now on our YouTube channel. Hopefully they've, they've watched it, uh, but if not, go ahead and watch it after listening to this podcast of the project that you spent the past couple weeks deep in. It's your first big foam fabrication project Yeah. Uh, in time for Halloween. Can you talk about the mannequin you have next to you and, and that wig? Yeah, this is this is it. This is what I've been completely absorbed with for the past, I mean, probably the past month. I've never worked with EVA foam ever. So okay. I wanted, I was like, this is the year. Every year I do, an, you know, a different handmade costume. And I was like, this is the year I'm going to learn about EVA foam. So I researched, I read Bill's book, I watched all the videos and I got some foam and I made this, this wig, this Marie Antoinette wig. It's, it's rather large. It's very big. Um, it, is, it is so beautiful, Jen. I, for those who aren't watching the video, it, it looks like, it almost looks like a cartoon come to life. Uh, it has bold lines. I know exactly, I knew exactly that it was Marie Antoinette. The second I saw it, it just like, it reeks of that. And it's oversized is, feels very comic booky. Talk about, talk about this, this, this month long obsession. Uh, oh man. Well, I mean, I started like any project with a ton of research. So I was like looking for, and there's luckily there's lots of images of her. There's all these fantastic political cartoons of like a person and then another person sized tower of hair on top of it. So there's just great reference images. Um, and then, you know, really there's lots of Halloween wigs of this and figuring out what's the best hybrid of different styles to create something that fe- that reads as Marie Antoinette, but that has its own style and, and works in EVA foam and uh, yeah. So and it's also wearable without ruining your neck. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that that too. Uh, you'll see in the video. It's it's I don't know. It's quite challenging. Luckily, I'm not going to any dance parties this year wearing this. <laughs> so I I will tell you that uh, in the early '90s, I worked at a San Francisco institution that went went for almost 40 years called Beach Blanket Babylon. Uh, and Beach Blanket Babylon was famous for its ridiculously huge wigs. And I will tell you that um, making that show was, working on that show was so hard, a chiropractor was our general practitioner because everyone needed tweaks all the time. And the big wigs were actually frequently supported on aluminum back braces that the actresses wore with uh, upright uh, pieces of aluminum that held the wig up so they weren't balancing it on their neck. That's wow. crazy. And they would disguise that underneath of the hair and stuff? Absolutely. In fact, the builder of many of those wigs is a uh, 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 Project Runway finalist, Chris March. Huh. Uh, he was a finalist a few years ago on Project Runway, and he was the wig master at uh, at Beach Blanket Babylon for many years, uh, including the years that I was there. Cool. I will, I'll have to write these names down and, and add that to my research. That sounds awesome. I've, I found so many amazing, like there's Obviously, there's a really awesome cosplay community, but wigs specifically, like foam wigs and just big oh. theatrical wigs, there's so much good stuff out there to sink your teeth into. So I had a, I had a blast with this. I, I love this. Oh. Okay, so when you were doing your research and you found all the pieces, there was a certain point in which you decided upon the size. 
Yeah, I did, uh, and, and this is covered in the video, but I did a, a huge cardboard prototype first. So I made, I plastic wrapped my whole head to make the pattern and taped it and you know made, made the cap. And then I, uh, I took, actually I have them right here. I made all these paper, you know, I attached paper and cardboard. I made a cardboard thin structure and then put the, the uh, paper pieces on it to figure all of this out before I started cutting it in foam. Right. And then use, I used all these to make the patterns for the foam pieces. Ah, was there a point at which you decided on the size where you were like, I'm not sure I'm right about this, uh, <laughs> this might be too big? Yeah, I started off huge, like ridiculous, enormous. And I took some pictures, which I learned that from you. Like you, you wanna see the thing, but you also wanna see how it looks on camera. So I took some pictures, I looked at those. I ended up scaling it down a little bit, which is like, it was even bigger than this, but um, yeah, I went back and forth with the size a little bit. And what, where does it feel like cartoony, but not ridiculous, like I can't move in it, so. You mentioned political, political cartoons and it really immediately evokes like just like the hand-drawn, like line drawings because yeah. of, you know, the, the way the curls are. And it's, you, I think you talked about the balance as a fabricator and as a sculptor of something that can go way toward realism. like people we know work in foam can make things look like other materials, really try to hide the fact that it's foam, but it's like, it, it you, you going for the style leans into the, its materials uh, and it, it's cartoonish. Yeah, I think I, I felt like instead of trying to mimic hair and like individual strands, yeah. I was like, I'm gonna do a more gestural, more kind of cartoony thing. And it's funny because in person, like I can see there's all this texture where I sand it in, but it doesn't read as much on camera. So I actually like seeing it now and seeing the footage, I'm like, oh, it needs more, it needs more paint. It needs more detail because it's not, it doesn't have the the texture and the dimension that it does in person. It reads differently in, in video. Yeah, you need to go way farther for camera than you need to go in person. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm learning that every time. Like I've watched you do that with builds where I'll see you painting something and I'm like, oh, really? But then on camera, it, lo it looks, you know what it's gonna look like on camera and it right. reads perfectly. This, I was like, I don't wanna take it too far. And now that I'm seeing it on camera, it's it sort of flattens out all the texture that I put in there, so yeah. Was there a point in the build or more than one at which you felt like you were losing hope? Uh, several, several points. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'd love to hear about one of those. I mean, to me, that's always it's always about the three quarter mark for me in a build is the point at which I'm like making progress, but it's not fast enough. And I'm pretty sure it's not gonna be what I want. And I think this is a total disaster every single build. So where did that occur for you? Uh, the, the two, the one, the main one that sticks out is there was a point when I had to start gluing. So I, I had all these pieces cut and I was pinning it all. I was pinning it into the foam, into, into the head. And I, it just wasn't, it didn't read to me. And it, I think it's because the, the layering and the seams were not, they weren't reading as a total thing. It just looked like a bunch of mishmash. But I was like, yeah. I have to start gluing it. it. It has to be attached somehow. So that point where, where I was like, I don't trust that this is gonna look like what I'm imagining in the end. Uh, and then I struggled with the paint. Like I, I used Plasti Dip on this for the first time. Yep. And that's totally different than any other spray paint I've used. It's, it goes on, you have to put it on really thick and it was bubbling. Like it was getting all these little air bubbles from the foam oh, pores. Really? It, yeah, there was a point at like nine or 10 o'clock at night one time I was painting in my alleyway and it was bubbling up and I'm painting pr practically in the dark. And I, I brought it inside and I was like, Oh, I've ruined it. I've totally ruined this. <laughs> uh, I actually messaged Bill. I was like, how do I get myself out of this? I painted this whole thing. The paint looks like crap. I can't stand it. I mean, I, it's hair. I can't stand it off. He yeah. was like, just add more, add more layers, heat, you know, heat gun. So a lot of doctoring up, a lot of, you know, fudge and stuff that you can't see on camera where you are. But yeah, there was a lot of like, oh, what have I done? When, uh, when I'm working with a new material, there's frequently like when I start to, when I take a look at that first aesthetic assembly, that's when it is so far from what I was intending that I'm like, I don't even know where to begin with how crappy I've made this thing. Is that sort of like what you're describing, pulling it in from there? A hundred percent. Yeah. When oh. you're starting to see like the layers are on. So you're starting to get an idea of like, what's the silhouette? What is the, what is this going to be? And it's, it was, I'm looking at my reference and I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, this is not, this does not work at all. Yeah. Um, did, um, what did you do? Did you take a break that night and come back fresh the next morning? 
Uh, a little bit of that, a little bit of, I pulled a lot off. Like I had, it was all pinned, so I just yanked everything off. Uh, I tried attaching it in different ways. I think there was one point I talked about this too, and, and I think about this a lot with builds like this where there's lots of texture and layers. Is like, there's a point when you can go too far. You can put too much detail and too much texture and it doesn't, nothing reads. It so, starts to go gray. It yes. starts to go, yeah. So I was worried that I was starting to get that. But once, I don't know, I, I figured out a combination of like, these parts need to be smooth and this can be a gesture and this can be more rendered. And I think it reads, I mean, I think it, I think oh, it totally works. reads. And no, the things reads. like the flowers too, like those little accents. Um, we filmed you in uh, at the Tested Studio with the, the full reveal for this. And those things, like the, the accessories you made, just like they, they pop and they hide any, you know, I, I couldn't tell that you had made any mistakes or had to go back at any point. <laughs> Well, there's, there's this aspect of the, what you're talking about, the gestures, which is the way I always think of these things, is it never ceases to surprise me that I'll begin a build like that and think, well, there's all sorts of curls, so I had tons of curls. And then I look and, like you said, there's way too many. It doesn't actually say curl to me when I look at it from a distance. And then you might end up pulling off a bunch and just adding one that is really clearly curly, and then your brain goes, curls. Yeah. Right? It's like... It's like you're figuring out, what, out a way to communicate to your own eye the story of what the wig is set telling, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's funny how much that translates across so many different design processes. It's like it, it applies for a sculpture, it applies for a logo, anything you're making. Like it's like when you when you design something in black and white before you do it in color because you want to see that the the form reads as what it's supposed to read as. Um, yeah, I, I learned a ton. And also, I mean, I'm sure you can both relate to this, but like learning a new process and a new material on camera while tr while trying to tell a cohesive story was like, ah. I was going to yeah, say, no, uh, uh, yeah, as someone who's gone through footage of both of you who filmed yourselves yeah. on a variety of builds, uh, it's funny that you can I can I can see the waves of like of energy and of just in type of footage and how much you're, you know, talking to camera or, or what yeah. becomes a, a long process shot. And those are reflective not only of the type of build you're doing, but also where your mental state is at. And it's it's very eerily similar, just like if, if there was like a, like a, a histogram of, you know, types of footage or duration of footage or, or tone of footage, uh, which I think goes right to the thing you were saying, Adam, like at some point of the project, you know, you just have to shift the balance of like focusing on filming versus finishing. And, and also like, I have expectations about I want the audience to get something out of this. I'm I'm hoping there'll be a big reveal at the end. Uh, I did a build yesterday in which I had to call the end of the build, even though it wasn't perfectly satisfying to me. And I think people are going to, I think people are going to be a little pissed off about it, but I was really honest about why I'm letting this one go and why I'm stopping where I'm stopping. And it's, it's, I, I, I always go home at the end of those days and I, I second guess a bit. I, I end up second guessing, Did, am I revealing too much or do I seem like I'm too pissed off or what's going on? And then frankly, every time, the more I'm questioning those videos, when they go up, the more rewarding the response is um, because th that kind of truth really resonates with people watching that vulnerability happen. Yeah, it's an honesty that you naturally are resistive against, especially when the camera is on because the history of how you interact with camera and how, how producing works right yeah so uh jen what is the have you have you built a a costume a dress for the wig i didn't build the dress but i got let's see okay. if i can pull it out extricate okay. it from my pile of nonsense here um oh, i got a huge uh 1980s big puffy shoulder <laughs> The shoulders are, I mean, the shoulder is like bigger than my whole leg. It's huge. Amazing. Um, but I thought, I, I kind of tried to tie in the color scheme and I felt like there, it, there's, I could have gone 18th century with a big hoop dress, but I was like, yeah. whatever I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing on Zoom. No one's going to see the bottom part of this. 
So I yeah. need I need drama at the top, and I thought it'd be a great kind of mashup to do 18th century Versailles with 80s glam rock, and I thought that was a great totally. that was a great mashup. So that's what I went I, for. I, as Sophia Coppola demonstrated, I think they're closer than most people realize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually watched that movie as as reference for this to <laughs> kind of research. see another look. Nice. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I will tell you, uh, Jen, in the storage space, uh, in the similar bins that all my Legos are stored in, I have two full containers of costume jewelry if you need anything. Oh, okay. That's and there's all know. sorts of bangles and rings and baubles and pins and stuff. Um, you might just go sift through that and see if any of it's useful. Uh, thank you. That's that's of course. great. Uh, yeah, that's I found some I'm stuff. Stored. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the the vibe is just over over layered decadent i mean that's what she was she's like the the villain of of uh oh what do you call it she's just i don't know she's just overdone with everything she was like the perfect example of consumerism and decadence and everything that the monarchy represented to the revolutionaries right like she's the she's the villain of that um well i feel like you should walk the street <laughs> with tiny, tons of tiny little pieces of cake giving them out to people yeah this was my Oh, there it is. <laughs> Foam cake. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, she felt like an appropriate, an appropriate villain for the times, you know? Um, Amazing. But Was Amazing. there a part of working with EVA Foam end to end from, you know, making the cap to the painting that you found that you liked, that that's the part of the working with foam you like the most? Uh, I think it it reminds me a little bit of working with clay because it's so... It's, it's additive and it's subtractive. Like there, I felt like there wasn't any point that I did something that I couldn't undo because it's, you can keep layering or you can carve away from it. Like it's so malleable and soft. So I really, I mean, I haven't worked with other, other types of EVA foam, like this particular brand was, it's smooth, it sands really nicely. So I felt like it was very forgiving to try as a, as a new medium and, and to manipulate in all the ways. And a lot of it was like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm working with a two millimeter sheet good and trying to make it have life and movement in a way that looks like hair. So I was almost, I was trying to let the material dictate. So I would, I would carve these lines in and then I'd heat it and start to bend it. And then as, you know, like as a, as a crease wanted to form, I was like, oh, okay, good. It wants to do that. And then keep pushing it in that direction. So as almost like as a sculptor, that was really fun quality of the material to work with. And because you're letting the material dictate the visual movement, you're getting what feels like much more natural visual movement. It's not like you sculpted a monolithic wig that was just perfect and then cast it. Yeah, I couldn't recreate this exactly. Even if I have I have the pattern, I can't make it this way again because the foam will behave differently the next time I work with it. But yeah, that lent a really dynamic quality to it. I'm curious, so what is inside the two millimeter foam? Uh, it's a it's a fin structure. So I made like a slot uh, slot construction. So the mm -hmm. the bottom of it is all curved and it glues onto the head. And then I basically just wrapped a skin. So each of these are you know it's maybe five five or six inches wide piece of foam, and I just wrapped those and skinned around the uh, ah. the skeleton basically. Amazing! It looks stunning. I can't wait to watch this video. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I have seen various executions of foam wigs. Um, people have done it on superhero costumes at Comic-Con, but I don't think I've ever seen one quite that large. <laughs> it's just, I, I feel like you almost want to hold some sort of, you know, the Pope carries that staff, the, what's called a crozier. Huh. The crozier. Uh, and um, yeah, I feel like you almost want something like that, like a swagger stick. Yeah, something she can she can point and give commands with or something. Exactly, because she wouldn't use her fingers. No. She would never be scepter. So. Yeah, <laughs> very King George. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, this was this was my uh, my life for the past month. I've, I'm so obsessed with this as a material now. I'm like, now I want to make everything in foam. Um, that is fabulous. Um, it just looks terrific. Well done. Thank you. I'm I'm, I'm gonna devour this. Yeah. What's that? Are you gonna put the whole thing on a mannequin and, I, and dress it up for? for swords, I just started looking. Display? I mean, I have my two back here. I was like, does does Carmen or April get downvoted, or do I need an additional? Like, <laughs> do I need another mannequin? So I've been looking on Craigslist for another one that that has a head that I can put the wig on and and do the do the full Marie Marie ensemble with. So yeah. Oh. 
Norm, do you have any Halloween plans? We have, it's all baby oriented. Yeah, of course. Yeah, baby's been sick, yeah. And so like last year we did Jurassic Park themes. Actually, I, I think it's, it's really funny because I was uh, the BD Wong character from Jurassic Park. We had a dinosaur costume for the baby, but Aww. Danica uh, was uh, the DNA, the DNA strand with ah. uh, with bubbles. Uh, and cool. and this year we're doing um, we're doing Sleeping Beauty, uh, and I think Avery's gonna be um, Prince Philip. Uh, Danica Danica's gonna be Maleficent, and I have a giant crow costume. So Ooh. I'm gonna be the crow on on her shoulder. Perched. Aww. Nice. Yeah. And do you guys? I mean, yeah. I guess it's different this year, but will you guys go? S- Somewhere, or you, or you just kind of like do an inside. Halloween? I think it's just kind of for ourselves. Yeah. I think you know Halloween is, is so it's a it's a perfect excuse to dress up, and we'll take photos as a family. You know, we'll kind of wave to our neighbors and, and, and from our windows, and um, and if people come by, we'll have candy. But yeah, well, I don't think we'll, we'll probably do you know, a walk. I don't. I have, I have no idea how. Slingshots for the yeah. candy. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. A big a, a, a pail to lower with with string. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what's gonna be like. It's weird. It's very yeah. weird. Yeah. And Adam, for you, Halloween is like year round. Like you get to do this all the time. It is. I've been. I I, I feel like if I was gonna move around the neighborhood, I might put on. I might put on Totoro. Yeah. That that is that is definitely always a great go to. He's easy to wear and easy to take out, and he lives in my living room, so he's not too far. <laughs> Um, but then I was also considering perhaps one of the spacesuits, which has its own filtering. Oh, there you go. So, so that I would be protected, and I could just go to the go to the store dressed in my spacesuit, and uh, that would effectively be the mask because there's the exhaust is filtered. Yep. I mean, and, it, it, sorry, go ahead. No, as I say, it's just Halloween's just a social event, and that you know costumes are meant to attract and and you know build a sense of interaction and community and, and photos. And that's, I, I don't know if that's what will happen yeah. or if that's what people will want to do. I know. It's very curious. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of interested to see how it plays out here in San Francisco, which is a very famously celebratory town for Halloween. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like everyone's doing a, a different version of it, but it'll, it's always like you watch the Halloween movies, you get the pumpkins, you do all that stuff, but it'd be cool to see, I don't, I haven't been invited to any yet, but it'd be cool to see if people do some like online Halloween stuff, you know, costume parties. And I've heard of, I think there's a pet costume party that I've heard about. Um, so there's, I, I have always wanted to take my terrier and do the two dogs carrying a package costume for her. Oh, <laughs> I've never gotten around to it. I, she doesn't like sitting still to have stuff strapped to her, but you know, I might be able to get her to agree <laughs> with enough treats. Oh. So Jen, this is your latest project, and I don't remember when the last time we had you on the podcast. But this whole summer, we've all been, of course, working from home, and you know, you've been coming in and out of the the office to do some stuff. But what are the things that you've been doing to to help you know as a creative outlet? Uh, I've been, I've been trying to get my space here more organized so that it can be more functional. Cause you know, I, I come into the shop and work in the evenings and I've being able to have that space, but now I'm trying to work more at my house and, uh, yeah, just like the, the shop organization and like efficiencies, like building all of those efficiencies of like, it's also, this is also my living area, so I can't set up a, a table saw in my dining room, um, but I'm thinking about a, a workbench that I want to build that has wheels that I can work in the house, but then when I need to, it's narrow enough to slide out my door into the into the courtyard or into the street, and I can make my messes outside and then wheel it back in for stuff. So lots of brainstorming, lots of, uh, I found a, um, I can't show it to you because it's out of frame, but I found a uh, a baker's rack. I, I, you would probably appreciate this, Adam. It's got the the trays in it, so you can you know you can put out pull out all the trays. They're like three yep. inches apart, and that's yeah. been great because I can I can set up a project, and then if I'm not working on it, it goes into a tray, and it's out of it's off my work my workbench. So having you know just a place to stash things that's organized but off out of the way. Um, yeah, mostly mostly just getting my space dialed in so it's more functional. You did a project earlier in the summer of lighting, and yeah. it's where you you lit up like your your living space, and you made some barn door lights. And I've been thinking about that lately. And lighting is something I feel like uh, now that I'm just at home all the time. I just hate like room lighting. Yeah, and it's like 
why not take the time to buy some cheap LEDs? Yeah. This is the thing. That central fixture in the middle of the ceiling is the worst light for lighting anything ever. And every time I turn on the single overhead light, I want to kill myself. I don't really want to kill myself, but I can't stand it from a design perspective. I'm a huge fan of lamps, lamps, lamps everywhere. I want little pockets of warmth as, as far as the eye can see. Yes, and especially just like you can buy bulbs now that are very, um, they're not wide, they're just narrow focus and like kind of little spots. Um, and yeah, looking at that, I've been loving, I, I did a video of this uh, this little magic arm, mini magic arm, Ooh. but I attach a LED light to it and it has a, a snoop, but I've been like pointing at things in my office and like, I love, me like every time we go to a museum, Adam, I love museum lighting. I feel like yeah. people who design, because they have big open rooms, but they can mount lights anywhere and everything they have on display is so beautifully lit. It's why it makes them so easy and great to photograph. Like how can I make my living space look more, or my working space look more like museum lit? And so I'm thinking a lot about that. And yeah, and Jen, that, more that shadow boxes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and little <laughs> barn doors. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah. There's like, a, it's yeah. like little vignettes. Like you're creating these little areas of look over here. Now look over there and moods for the whole space. Um, there's one, speaking of museums, I think I've mentioned this once before. There is a, one of my favorite museum displays of all time is in the Museum of Natural History in New York. And it's a, it's a whole wall. It's probably like two stories tall. And it's, uh, it's sort of like a frosted acrylic with uh, a whole t like taxidermied animal. So, it, and it's, it's, they're all organized, like it'll be like a turtle and then a smaller turtle and a smaller one and a smaller one. So it's this very sort of organized taxonomy of things and it's all backlit just by this diffused white glowing wall. So it's like, it's silhouettes, but you can, they're also lit from the front and it's, it's so beautiful and so satisfying in this like mm, organized, way of, I don't know, of looking at something, but I've, I've wanted to recreate that. I don't quite know how, but I've wanted to recreate that like organization of things backlit with the labels. And it's just, it's, it's such a phenomenal display. I've taken so many pictures of it. Um, that type of inspiration, it will follow you for your whole life. I can guarantee you. I, I will tell you that the, the lit cabinets here in the cave are all inspired by a nightclub in New York in the mid eighties called MK. And it was built into a former bank building right off of 23rd and Broadway in New York. It was a super hot club. You can actually see it. Christopher Walken has dinner in it in the movie, The King of New York by Abel Ferrara. Hmm. Um, and MK, the coat check room was the old vault of the bank. So it was like one of those huge round doors yeah, with yeah. some bored girl behind it taking your coat for 10 bucks. Um, but the top floor of MK had a gold felt pool table and the room was lined in lit cabinets filled with bones and that is completely the inspiration for the display area of my wow. cave and will be for the next you know the next when i move from this cave to another one i'll be still following that same kind of muse i mean everything's a remix right yeah yeah it's like where it's it's like watching a show like the way things production design, the way rooms are organized and lit on screen or in a designed space is so rarely how we just encounter spaces in the real world. You know, when you think of like in the West Wing, a great example, they they faithfully recreated so much of the White House, but those, you know, you, they never had up lighting against plants, right? And, and the, but it makes that room feel dramatic and it creates a, a, an emotion as you're, you're watching it. And those emotions, you know, I'm sure when you first walked in that space, you felt something and like, sometimes it takes a while. What is it that I, I like about this? Uh, and I, I love like picking at that. Well, I, I had an ex who had an impeccable design eye, and her design philosophy was lovely. It was, how does the room look from the next room? So mm. she framed every room to be seen through the doors to that room. And it meant that each room that she designed was a room you wanted to go in, like you were drawn through the portal into the room. It's like, yeah, it's like the little preview of like, what, what is it about it that makes you want to be in that space before you even get into it? 
<laughs> exactly. And I mean, you know, we do a lot of work in our house to design room, to design and move the furniture around so that the room has flow. We want to be able to use the room. We want it to fulfill its utility. Um, but when my ex introduced that idea to me of what it looks like through the, through the portal of the door, it was a fascinating lens. And yet everyone wants this open concept. Open concept, open concept. <laughs> I, and so do I. I love an open concept kitchen. I want to bust down that wall between my dining room and my kitchen. I want more room in there, of course. Um, it's we have it's a big open loft space here, but it's a rental, so I can't you know I can't do anything major to it. But trying to create like how do you create this is a separate ambiance and delineation between spaces and functions and moods in a space that has no walls. It's like that's an interesting challenge. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Um, in a space that's inspiring yeah. to you, right? As you operate in, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally key. I, I, I really like being inspired by the space that I live in, and it's not always right. Like you come, I just got back from a trip, and like lots needed a little bits of adjusting to make it to make it home again. Um, Jen, it is a wonderful achievement that Marie Antoinette wig, and it's even more impressive given that it's your first time working with that EVA foam. It's just gorgeous. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm uh, I'm very excited about it, and I got I got bit by the bug, so there'll be more there'll be more EVA foam awesome. creations. <laughs> Um, and also full marks for being willing to try out a new material on camera for the first time <laughs> and all of the resulting uh, potential trauma that can result from that. Well, we'll see how it does. We'll see how the video uh, is received. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, yeah. We have that video on the site uh, and we have other projects. Uh, Kate has some projects, Kate Zapaker. We did film some projects with her as well, uh, which will be rolling out all kind of Halloween themed as your costume uh, was for Halloween. And also we have a, a new website. So I want to give a big shout out to the team working on the new website, which just launched uh, today as we're recording this. So um, Kristen, uh, of course, and uh, Nick from our uh, product team um, shepherded that through and it looks beautiful. So I uh, hope you all enjoy it and uh, love to know your thoughts. Send, the, new, send tweets. the new site looks absolutely gorgeous. I'm super excited about it. I can't wait to actually start to navigate it when I get home. Yeah, it's it's awesome. It's very it's very streamlined. It's very modern. It feels like ah, we're here now. Okay, we're we're in yeah. we're in this uh, in this time period. One well, of the Jen, few bright spots of 2020. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We'll take them where we can get them. Jen, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Good to see you both. Absolutely. All right, guys. I'll see you. See we'll see you next week. See you next week. See ya.